Thank you all so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at 92Y, and particularly wonderful to be here with Ash Carter, the former Secretary of Defense, someone who is so eminent and so widely admired uh, in many administrations from your service. And of course, inside the five-sided box is a wonderful tour d'horizon and also a great um, primer on leadership, which can apply to any of our professions, but uh, most particularly, of course, to the Pentagon, to the military, and to the military and to the institutions that are, I believe, in my experience of covering foreign policy, which goes back to um, the Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan years when I was first in <coughs> Washington, has never been under greater stress. So, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for being here yourself, Andrew. Well, appreciate it. it's, it's great timing because there is a few things going on. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about a lot of hot spots around the world. and. We're here because we're not at the Munich Security Conference right. where I was last year and where you many, were I used to for go with John McCain for 15 years. Wow. I miss John every day. We used to go and fly from Andrews and um, can't never be the same without him. And I covered John McCain and uh, really honor him. And we all miss John McCain in American politics, and particularly, I think, uh, the last two years more than ever. Um, and it's, it is quite surprising, and I know that this is a little outside of your terrain, but you testified and worked the Hill and know it so well, to see the partisan divide now in Washington, which does infect everything, particularly military policy, foreign policy, the Ukraine issue was the center of the impeachment. Um, I've never seen it quite like this. I covered the Cold War. I covered a lot of things. But I've never seen this kind of dysfunction, particularly in the Senate, where yeah. senators in both parties were always committed to fact-finding. Yeah, there were always. I, I started in the Reagan administration. And uh, at that time, I mean, there, there are two things that are different now. One is that uh, people used to talk across the and get and really know one another and make deals and it was just normal uh, next they left defense out of it we were never and really right up until the i mean when i left three and a half years ago the department uh, it was very rare that even in today's polarized congress they would draw to draw defense in but the other thing is that there were people like john mccain who were um uh loved the country and the institution and very staunch about right and wrong and so and you couldn't move him with partisan tides and i always liked that now you know every once in a while he'd bite my head off so i've had my sharp sharp side of john i've been there too uh, yeah yeah we all have uh, anybody who anybody who knew him but uh andrea he you could always count on him to come through on the things that were really deep and uh, you know, important to the country in the long term. There aren't those giants left. I go around the Senate now, and I don't I single anybody out. But and I look around, and I say, well, boy, you know, there are maybe ten people who are anywhere near the wattage of those. I knew, you know, Sam Nunn, Dick Luger. I worked with them all through the '80s and '90s, and just aren't any of them. Of them I'm left, and it, you feel it. And it was bad, I think, under Harry Reid also. I had less observation of that at the time. Um, so it, it's, you know, there's, it's on both sides. Uh, but they don't act as a check now. Well, I want to ask you about Ukraine, because there was bipartisan support, overwhelming support, for the military aid package that was voted Ukraine. And as a matter of law, according to the GAO, uh, the only way to freeze or impound that money, not distribute it once it's appropriated, is an act of Congress. So how do people in the Senate and elsewhere explain and excuse holding it back for 55 days when a new president was trying to stand up 
and develop some kind of leverage for his negotiations with Vladimir Putin, who had already invaded and occupied yeah. his, his country. I, I don't know, because one of the things that the Congress has most tenaciously clung to in all its years is the power of the purse. So to me, I couldn't move one nickel for an ongoing war without the appropriators raising hell. So it is unusual that, um, you know, usually they're very jealous about who, who really spends the money. Remember, I submitted a defense budget, so I send in a $700 billion defense budget. That's just me and the president talking. From their point of view, that's just a proposal. We think that's the defense budget, but not to them. To them, that's just, that's just the start of the game. So. Just today, the president, uh, again, with Gerardo Rivera on a radio program, vilified Alexander Vindman, lieutenant colonel decorated in Iraq uh, from an immigrant family who was part of, according to retired four-star Barry McCaffrey, who is one of our colleagues at NBC, is part of an elite program assigned to the National Security yes, Council. Yeah. Well-trained, right. obviously brilliant in languages, he and his twin brother, and was frog-marched out of the complex. Uh, Secretary Esper, one of your successors, said that he would be protected, but the president has now suggested that action will be taken against him and said so again today. Well, Mark, Mark Esper's right. He should be protected. And you, you got to go back to these professional cadres we have, which include the professional military, but all, the foreign service, the intelligence service, and then uh, professionals and other agencies as well. We are unusual among governments around the world in the, that we ventilate substantially every four years. So in the Pentagon, it goes down four layers every time the president changes. And the good side is you get fresh blood in there. The bad side of that is you inevitably get amateurs and so forth in there. But underneath that, and per particularly in the, I mean, can you imagine if we changed out the military every four years and you had people who had never done it before all fighting wars? You need professionalism in order to have America, in this case, win wars, but be good at anything that government uh, does. And so you have to kind of respect professionalism. And when you do something like that to somebody who's a, a professional and was doing his duty as he, he saw it, it's more than just a transgression against that individual. It's a tr transgression against something that uh, the professionalism of, 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 of government. You know, government now, Andrea, people just love to hate the government. And my attitude to the government is it is just us. It's not a thing. It's just us. Government is how we come together to do things that will not get done without the government. So the roads aren't going to get paved without the government. They're not going to get plowed without the government. The country's not going to get defended or certainly defended well uh, without the government. So it is how we collectively do things uh, that we think are necessary. And so we all have a stake in the excellence of implementation. I talk in the book about running the place. People think the Secretary of Defense is making defense policy all the time. He's not. He's running half the government a lot of the time, including taking care of people who are uh, uh, doing the right thing, making sure there are vindmans, that there are deeply trained, deeply knowledgeable people who are willing to do what we do, which is work them hard, send them to dangerous places, not pay them a lot, and occasionally treat them not this badly, um, but uh, you know, treat them, treat them badly. And boy, don't take all that for granted. How does it uh, damage authority? military authority if the commander-in-chief intervenes in a court-martial? Uh, not good. Um, and there were, we had cases when I was secretary and when I was deputy in the number three job and so forth, um, where the, remember, I, uh, remember the guy who shot people at Fort Hood and his trial and I was... The Colonel Hassan? Yeah. Yeah, 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 and you know, I'm the guy who uh, shaved him before, I didn't personally do it, but shaved him before his trial because 
he, he didn't want to take his beard off, but our regulations say you have to take your beard off, and our lawyers said, uh, um, and so uh, I always respected the Uniform Code of Military Justice and the, 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 the military justice process. We very, I don't, I never did. And in my memory, going all the way back to Caspar Weinberger, my boss, I don't remember a Secretary of Defense or a Commander in Chief reaching down into the military justice system. And again, that's just that's that's something that needs to proceed professionally. If I saw, if I had seen bad conduct there among the judges or malfeasance and how people were represented and so forth, I would change the institution or make sure the institution, but not a particular case. I never saw it happen, and I never did it myself. Looking around the world, what worries you most? What well, part of the world? Yeah, unfortunately, there's conflict? no shortage, and people wonder why we spend $700 billion a, a year, and I always used to talk about cricket, they called it. We, the military loves acronyms, and I, I talk China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and terrorism. So I used to always tell our guys, Never mind all these abstractions. Just remember, these are the five people that, at a minimum, we got to take care of. Nobody else has to hold up a whole hand. You go over to China, it's us. You go to North Korea, it's us. You go to Iran, it's us. You go to Al Qaeda or ISIS, it, well, it's lots of people in their case, but very importantly, uh, us. So the, the honest, if you're responsible for taking $700 billion and making sure that the country is defended and safe, I got to I gotta spread my bets a little bit. So I always, so it's always hard to, who's the biggest, obviously China's the biggest dog and the most consequential. Uh, in the long run, Russia doesn't matter nearly as much, except they have nuclear weapons and we have Putin, whom I've known for 30 years, and I know you have uh, also, who, Part of his plan is to foil us or thwart us everywhere, and so you can't have that. North Korea, I mean, I don't need to elaborate on that one. Uh, Iran, and so it's a, it's, uh, it's a lot to, um, to do, it doesn't narrow down. Does it matter that the president, in his first meeting in Singapore when we were covering that summit, unilaterally decided to suspend military exercises in South, with the South Koreans without the prior approval of his defense secretary. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have recommended that uh, to him. Here's why. Uh, I, we, all, we never, in all the decades, I saw presidents dealing with North Korea, um, which goes back again to Reagan. We occasionally had talks. We had some in the early 90s, the late 90s, uh, Condi Rice and Colin Powell tried it around 2006. Obama never did even try. I don't think he thought it would work. But I don't, I'm not against talking to the North Koreans. But one thing that we never put on the table, and I would have opposed putting on the table as Secretary of Defense, is exercises. And the reason for that is that exercises are the way that we make sure that we're, we and the South Koreans together are effective enough to stop a North Korean invasion and destroy the North Korean armed forces and ultimately the North Korean regime, meaning that if they start a war, we will win. They need to see that because they need to know they're going to lose and therefore they shouldn't start it. That's what deterrence is about. And, we, and whether they have nuclear weapons or not, even before they had nuclear weapons, and I worked on military affairs on the Korean Peninsula, we sought to always strength, uh, strengthen and then show deterrence. So it's weakening deterrence to cancel exercises. That's the instrumental reason why I would have argued to the president, don't do this. I, I can't say what Jim, I guess Jim Mattis, my old friend, I have to say, 25-year-old friend, um, I, I don't know what Jim said at the time, but if I, so I can't speak for him, but if I had been secretary, I would have tried to stop it. With North Korea, and our allies, the South Koreans and the Japanese, when the president says that despite it being a violation of UN resolutions, that short-range missile tests are not a problem because they don't affect us. They're, they're not ICBMs. And well, how is that read in South Korea and Japan? Um, as a 
we don't care about you, we care, care about our, ourselves. Um, so it's not wonderful to say that to, to allies. Um, on uh, the other hand, um, privately, sometimes you have to say to the South Koreans, particularly the current South Korean regime, which is kind of a, a little soft from, compared to Lee or Park regimes, um, that you guys need to take care of yourselves a little bit here. You need to buck up your own spines. You need to keep investing in your own forces. We can't do everything for you. We are your allies. We have a dog in this fight too, because that's an important part of the world to us. And, and you know, Korea has North Korea as a problem, but I don't mind having a foothold on the Asian mainland. If you think about China, I kind of like being there. And same thing, having a friend in Japan. So if you think big picture, these guys are good to have as friends, even beyond North Korea. So you, every once in a while, you have to jack up allies. But I tended to do it personally. Um, same thing with the NATO allies. I, mean, I was going to ask you about NATO. How would you analyze our relationship with NATO right now? I think people who have been around a long time or who have a long-term view continue to recognize the value of the NATO alliance. And maybe it's worth saying, what's the point anyway? Or we'd all just keep going with something that's purpose ended a long time ago. So, I mean, to me, it's two things. Uh, the first is allies are not a favor you do for foreigners. They actually have force multipliers for us. Um, the NATO militaries collectively spend about half of what we spend. So together, we're 150% of ourselves. That's meaningful. They've done real stuff in Afghanistan. They did real stuff with us in Syria. I mean, don't just stand on the hot sidelines and hold our coat and stuff. Or uh, uh, Some of these guys are really good uh, and really very helpful. The other thing is values. So take a globe, spin a globe, and say, where are there people like us, or not to be like us, but who believe in things that we believe in? The values of the Enlightenment, their one place is, is Europe. And that's an important thing in a world of a communist dictatorship, China, which will soon be as large as we are, if it isn't already economically, of a Putin's Russia. Uh, and so forth. So I'm not inclined to jettison or thumb my nose at people whom I feel our long-term destiny is kind of tied up with and help us uh, stick up for the things that, that, are, that, are, that are important. How would you describe Vladimir Putin? He's a, <laughs> um, first of all, you don't have to speculate, because as you know, he says exactly what he thinks. So you just read. Um, but, and, and, it's, and he's been around a long time. He's fundamentally a spook. Um, and that's fundamentally where he comes from. Maybe we're all like that. I'm from Philadelphia and you'll never get it out of me uh, kind of thing. But he's a KGB guy and you'll never get it out of him. Um, he has a lot of beefs that I don't agree with, but that I can see where he's like, some, coming from. And you know, in geopolitics, you don't try to love people. You just you, where you can agree, you try to work with them, and where you can't, you got to stand against them. The, and that would be fine. That would be the normal thing we'd do with anybody. What makes it so hard with Vladimir Putin is on his to-do list is, you know, he's got Syria. OK, we can talk about that. He's got this uh, non-proliferation, arms control, nuclear weapons, and so But he has screw America on his to-do list. That's a little hard to discuss if you're American. And so building a bridge to this guy's mentality um, is, for that reason, really difficult. Now, you know, still, I'm for giving it a try. I think breaking contact with the enemy is never a wise thing to do. So it's important, because the Russian military, I know for a fact, is crazy, is think, is capable of imagining crazy things. You probably know this from your own reporting. But give them a, 
a little bit of a story and three months and they'll have turned it into a huge conspiracy. It's really amazing what they, and so if you talk to them and every once in a while you say, no, that's not right, we're not doing that. We're not you know, turning the molten middle of the earth and pointing it towards Russia and saying, here's, here's the proof. And then they go, well, okay. And they settle down for another few months. So it's not a good idea to lose contact with the Russian military. Their intelligence, you're an intelligence expert who've been covering our intelligence community for a long time. You know, for people who are pretty good at operations, they're pretty good at covert operations, I think they're lousy at, at analysis. He's p very poorly informed. We know that. Well. So perhaps the president is right to have all of this engagement with Putin. That, that would be OK if we didn't have the overhang of the president's past, which I don't know anything about. But I think that complicates things here at home because people are not quite sure what the past holds, for it, nor am I. Um, that doesn't foreclose the possibility of doing, but I think it ma makes it harder. If I'm putting myself in President Trump's shoes, it would make it harder to do that because immediately you're going to raise all these questions about the past and and Russia. So he may decide he may have decided that it's just not it's not worth it. Um, but on a, I still think it would be better on a few. And he doesn't have to do it himself personally. You can send somebody who's you delegate to do it, but on things like arms control, well, we can't avoid it because there's a ar major arms control agreement that's going to expire in June unless we No one seems to be paying very much attention to that. Uh, uh, true, and probably not, I mean, we'll survive if the agreement doesn't survive because, as a practical matter, neither of us is going to build up to the limits of those agreements, so they don't really cap anything. But letting a, our, the last, almost the last surviving arms control agreement of the past expire, I wouldn't, I'd be hesitant about that because it kind of signals that you don't care anymore. And I'll tell you, you know, I talked about China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and terrorism. All these things are, t are in the headlines, and rightly so, and you ask questions about them and so forth. Nuclear weapons aren't in the headlines, so we tend to forget about them. But man, if they're ever in the headlines, God help us. Uh, I, that's how I started. I'm a physicist. I worked on nuclear weapons. One, one nuclear weapon is just so destructive. People can never forget, never forget that. Uh, all the other things that we talk about and argue about pale in insignificance compared to even one nuclear weapon. So if you're responsible for that, as I was, you never take your eye off that ball. Well, one of the things that I think, going back in my own career, is the Nunn-Luger Agreement. Yep. The Cold War ends, and there are nuclear weapons prepositioned all over the place, Ukraine, for instance, and all that fissile material was carefully broken down and brought to the United States under this agreement. Do you know who ran that program? You did. The young Ash Carter. Yeah, no, I'm not kidding. I, I, she, I, 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 I she might have known that, that all, for five years in the 90s after Sam and Dick. I went to Tennessee. With, I was the with ran Condi that program. Rice. Yeah, yeah. $500 million a year we were spent Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. I ran that program for five years, and it was the Wild West. Imagine spending half a billion dollars of the taxpayers' money in immediate post Cold mm -hmm. War. Uh, Soviet Union and not, you know, testifying for the rest of your natural life about having some of it uh, funneled away. It was a real challenge. Big engineering projects, and we blew up silo. I took Sam and Dick and let, that, let, let them use an acetylene torch and cut apart a submarine, and then we go blow up a silo. and. And this it, sounds and like great, a lot of great fun. old time. Well, it was good because it highlighted them and therefore rewarded a bipartisan senators. And President never, pre, neither President ever, Bush or Clinton ever complained about this, giving them credit. And that's actually a great example of bipartisan, historic um, activity that originated with them. Remember, they thought it up, and. 
And it wasn't an executive branch thing. In fact, it was fought by the executive branch for a while on the very typical ground that we didn't invent it, therefore it can't be valid, but it was valid. How did you feel um, as a former defense secretary, an academic, uh, someone who understands leadership, when the president withdrew from Syria without the approval of Jim Mattis? Well, it's not good not to listen to your secretary of, of, of defense. More importantly, I think it was the wrong thing to do. Um, it, it is kind of get, at, get out itis, which is, I recognize, very popular in the, in the country, and we probably ought to talk about that in Iraq and Afghan, all these places that people are tired of. I, look, I'm tired of them too, and I don't know people are a lot tireder than you and I do. Stephanie, my wife here, we used to visit them every weekend in the hospital for eight years, so I know people are really tired of Afghanistan and Syria, but they don't want to get out, by and large, mm -hmm. and so it's a mistake because uh, if we don't, once you beat somebody down, you have to kind of sit on it for a while or it's going to come back. So what's going to happen in Syria is ISIS will, I don't know how long it'll take, elements of ISIS will reassemble re and then we'll have to go do it all over again, except next time we won't have these people with us because we screwed them unexpectedly. So that's my, that's why you don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to deal with these guys again. We fought the Iraqis four times now. I've been at this movie four times in the last, whatever, 25 years now. And so, and I designed and, and ran the counter ISIS campaign. And we always knew after we took Mosul and Raqqa that they'd dribble down the Euphrates, lower Euphrates Valley, and we'd have to go down and, and we actually hoped that they would live up to their pledge, which was to fight to the death, but unfortunately they didn't. And so there were still some left, and that's where they went. And um, I, don't wanna, I don't want them to come back. And then I've got to send in, and I've got I to gotta do it all over again. I mean, how many times do we have to do this? And so once you get them down, you've got to sit on them for a while. This idea of endless wars is a... That's not the right way to think about it. The war is basically over. And remember, the war never involved us in a serious way. We, were, we, we did not do in Iraq and Syria against ISIS what we did in Afghanistan, which is bear the brunt of combat. We deliberately, and this was a deliberate strategic decision on my part, I said, we're not, I'm not going to put us in there as infantry. We could have taken Mosul and Raqqa in a couple of days. You know that. But... That would have been the wrong thing to do strategically because, first of all, it would have been putting our guys in the position of infantry combat in, in a place where they don't speak the language. And so it, it's not our strength. To, you, don't, you don't fight on the enemy's terms if you can avoid it. That's thing one. Thing two, if, if we had gone in and done it ourselves, some of the people who, would have fought, who ended up fighting with us probably would have fought against us because we would have been invaders. Number three, we would be the proud owners of Mosul and Raqqa. Who wants Mosul and Raqqa? <laughs> What's second prize? So those are the reasons why I didn't do it that way. That's not what I told Obama. Let's go in and do it that, that way. So we always had very few people who were, and what we did was train Syrian and Iraqi infantry, and they went in, and then we brought down the big cyclone of American military power, logistics, firepower, intelligence, and behind them, and hypercharged them, and they took care of things. That was the way we we did things, and um, so even at that very intense phase. Our losses compared to, for, for example, the Afghan surge, which I was present for, were, were non-zero, but not nearly as large. Now what we're asking for in Syria is, is very few guys just to keep the Syrian defense forces, and many of whom are Kurds, true, um, in the fight, in our fight 
on our side. So that's a pretty good deal, and I wouldn't have walked away from it. Afghanistan, we hear that they are close to some sort of a peace agreement with the Taliban uh, without, it seems, negotiating some of the civil uh, reforms, quotas and protections for women, for instance, women in politics, women in education. But is it, is it time? I know you don't, you're I favoring doubt it. I doubt it because here's why. Um, historically, uh, internal conflicts have only been resolved when all of the parties have concluded that fighting anymore won't further advantage them. So let's take the Bos You were around the Balkan time. I did. I was with the. Did, did I-4 and our force in the Balkans? And, and why did we get to go to Dayton and negotiate three parties? It wasn't because we were great negotiators. It wasn't because, it was because all three of them were tired of fighting. Mm -hmm. So at one moment in history, they'd all had enough. And they didn't think that fighting anymore was going to get them anywhere. That's why we got them to Dayton. I don't think the Taliban has been beaten enough to be in that frame of mind. I think on the, that they think the opposite. That is, that we are tired of it, and that um, they therefore have the upper hand at the at negotiating table. So, I mean, I would like it to be different, Andrea, but you're asking me what I is, is I, I don't think that they're in the frame of mind that an agreement with them suggests they're in the frame of mind of. on top of which and this, so so what would you do if you were if I were a king which I'm obviously not uh, I would keep a small pres a US presence in Afghanistan continue to help the Afghan security forces to strengthen themselves which they have been doing not perfectly but they do pretty well to keep some basic order in that place, keep on giving the Afghan people, including women, very importantly, including women, uh, a better chance. And for us, that's not a big investment in troops or, and certainly not in lives, because um, we're not doing, mo and we wouldn't need to do mostly the, f the fighting like we were in 09 and 010. Um, also, don't forget, it's not bad to have a friend in that part of the world. Take out your map and look at that part of the world. Say, for example, we would never have gotten bin Laden in Abbottabad if we hadn't had Jalalabad in Afghanistan to take off from. So this idea that we won't all come home and do everything from Colorado or something, I don't. I, I like having real estate. It potentiates us. I'm just telling you, we could never have gotten to Abbottabad. You, you know what the map's like. Um, w w the reason we were able to get there is because we had a footprint in Afghanistan. So it isn't so bad to be there. So I would prefer to s that we stay, that we pursue this project um, with not no or very minimal American losses, certainly wind down our role as we have been for years now in combat. Um, but continue to stick with the, I mean, the Taliban, remember what these people stand for. Um, they took the country back to the Middle Ages. Um, so I'm, I'm a skeptic, I, but it looks like it's going to happen. You always hope for the best. I wish us the best. But you asked me whether I thought it was likely to succeed. I don't. I want to get to audience questions, but one question about Iran. Uh, you supported the nuclear deal for what it did, not it, well, for what it, it didn't do, obviously. Uh, yeah, no, it didn't change a whole lot of my job, except that I didn't have to worry about them getting nuclear weapons soon, as long as the agreement, because it gave me a little time. So it took a headache off my plate. Now, that didn't take all the headaches about Iran off my plate, but it took a headache. 
off my plate and it didn't do anything. I didn't have to do anything. It was not an arms control agreement that limited me in any way. That, that agreement didn't put any limits on the United States at all. It was all about what Iran could do. So as long as you didn't sucker yourself into thinking it was a big, a grand bargain, uh, it was fine. And now, of course, the governments decided against it, and I understand that. I don't think that's the end of the world. Um, I, I, I think the Iranians have not done a whole lot that they could have done. Um, and we've had gotten some of the benefits of it. Remember, we got to go in there and they destroyed some centrifuges and they destroyed a reactor, and so they can't get all that stuff back. And then two years later, the United States said, sayonara, we're leaving the agreement, but their reactor is still busted. So we got a little some freebies um, for it, and they haven't done much since. So I don't think it's the end of the world. I, 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 but I did think it was a good thing for us in defense at the time, provided everybody kept it in perspective. I'll tell you a story. Marty Dempsey was chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I would sit down with the chairman every morning, and we'd, uh, and Marty in those days, and he would sort of say, ask for guidance and what instructions for this, that, and the other thing. Morning after Kerry finished that agreement, he said, you know, what do we do now? And my instructions for the department is don't change anything. Don't keep 68,000 troops there. We still got plenty of headaches. Keep the ability to destroy the Iranian nuclear program militarily just in case they change their minds and they leave the agreement. Continue to oppose them everywhere we needed to, you know, and in Syria and Iraq. So we didn't change anything. Um, but we got a little something we could take off our near-term to-do list, um, which was welcome to me. So that was my reason. I want to take questions from the audience. And uh, please uh, raise your hands now. The lights come up so that I can see you better. There are microphones. And as Mr. Belfer said, please ask questions with a question mark. And short questions so we can get more of it in. Thank and you. any subject is fair, I should say. I'm not like Doctors Without Borders. I'll <laughs> Good asking. Great. This gentleman right here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, given that there's been some changes in how the current administration deals with the Defense Department and other departments, if that person were to be gone in the next election, what kind of, how, how, what efforts would it take to rebuild the trust that appears to be changing? Well, I think the Defense Department, I'll speak for the Defense Department first and then sort of more largely, um, is a pretty resilient place that has a deep keel. So it is, has not, when administrations change and has pretty steady. Now, it's true that the times we are in right now are particularly turbulent and polarized and so forth. Um, but I don't, I think the department will be fine going forward is my guess. I'm a little more worried about these alliance relationships that we were talking about earlier. And here's why. It, our allies tend to be democracies. And when you, disrespect a foreign leader or a foreign country, their people listen and it matters. And that's not true for North Korea. You can call him this one day and that the next day and he'll just tell his people to, that, that, to think whatever he tells them to think. But you don't do that in a democracy. And so I, I don't want us to tick off people who will last longer than whatever their elected government uh, is. And um, you know that's why you, you worry a little bit when you are allied with democracies. Your conduct matters um, and is instrumental in whether you can keep that alliance going. Um, and having said some things with which I obviously don't agree about allies and alliances, it may be harder to claw that part back. Interesting. Let's see. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, but they have a very unique point of view. What do you 
Do you want to wait for the microphone? Or? Yeah, thank you so much. As a guy with the best view about nuclear proliferation I know of, uh, what do you foresee, should we still exist 50 years from now when the world has 50 nuclear nations, perhaps? I hope we don't have 50. It's a really, really, really good question. And, uh, and because I said earlier that that is the most fearsome thing of all, and we've already lost so much ground over the last few decades. I mean, if you think about it, Pakistan, in India, which is not so much a problem for us, but Pakistan, um, Iran on the wobbly edge, North Korea totally out of control. Um, and remember that, that uran plutonium-239 and uranium-235 have half-lives of respectively tens of thousands and hundreds of millions of years. So you create this stuff which doesn't exist in nature, and it's around for a hell of a long time. So you've created a lasting menace to humankind in the hands of Kim Jong-un. Um, and it can get worse. <laughs> um, so, uh, and one of the, so combating proliferation is obviously paramount. That's one of the reasons why we did the Nunn-Lugar program was to secure those materials so when the Soviet Union collapsed into 15 countries and an internal um, social revolution, all that stuff didn't come out and create 15 nuclear states or worse, nuclear terrorists. Um, that's a big project. And that was one thing that we and, the, and Moscow always got along on. So you, to get back to your question earlier, we were talking about Vladimir Putin. You know, one of the things that Putin, if we could sit down with him and he'd stop trying to score a point, one of the things that the Russians and we have always agreed is we've got to do something that's a proliferation thing. And if we, if we pooled our efforts, uh, we could get somewhere. And China ought to think that way, too. And they could help us with, with North Korea. But we've kind of lost the energy on that in recent years. And there hasn't been nearly the attention to it. And I despair of of, of that, and it's not good, and I guess I was part of it, for that matter, uh, losing lock on it. We had so many other things to worry about. Hmm. Yes, on the aisle here. Thank you. <clears throat> Donald Trump is our num nation's number one draft dodger. How would you get rid of him? I'm not the right person to ask, to, to ask that. Uh, you, said, you said any question. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And you're welcome to answer the question. I guess I don't have a good answer to it. I, uh, I'm not, part I don't participate in the political fray. Uh, I never have. And I never absolutely did when I was in office. And I'm respectful of the office I used to occupy, maybe. Um, and so I'm very careful about staying out of, of, of uh, things like that. So I don't, I don't really have a, a good answer uh, to you. I will tell you a story as how important it was to me when I was Secretary of Defense. Uh, so when I did women in sort of the decision to open all military positions to women. This is an example on the other side of the ledger. Uh, something I didn't tell President Obama before I announced that. I don't know if you know this. And why? And the answer is I didn't want to politicize hmm. a decision. And he was he never, and you know, I used to see him every week. We'd have a one-on-one -on -one for an hour. And the week after that, I, I wondered, geez, I wonder whether I'll go in and he'll say, hey, come on, don't make major decisions and then not give me a chance to take credit for him. But he understood that, that I didn't want him to take credit for it because I didn't want it to be in any way a political, I wanted it to be purely a professional DOD decision. Because if you do something, if you let something like that become a football, you screw it up for 20 years. Um, 
And this was an important thing to do right. And, and because it wasn't politicized, you know I didn't get one, I made an, that announcement and I didn't get one letter from Congress on that. You can't close, as you know, the most miserable little base without getting 50 letters. And that decision, I didn't get, it, I didn't, I didn't get any letters. So there's a, I was always protective of the institution. You were talking about that earlier, Vindman and so forth. Um, and President Obama, to his credit, was mature enough to recognize when that was in the national interest and it wouldn't have been in the national interest to do otherwise, and I respect that uh, in him. But I tried really hard to keep us, and particularly our uniform people, out of the election. You remember how nutty the, the 2016 election was, right? I mean, there were lots and lots of candidates on both sides, and every press conference would be trying to get me or Joe Dunford, who was the chairman at the time, to answer a question about the election or one or the other candidate. And I always said, I, always, I said, I'm not answering that because I'm here and standing in front of the podium at the Defense Department and wherever I'm not allowing General Dunford to answer it. So go on and ask your next question, you know, <laughs> press corps. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me just, I'm just trying to see, we haven't had any, this, yes, right there. We had any women asking questions? Yeah, thank you. Please. Um, what is the single most dangerous or concerning event since this um, administration has taken office? And what do you see a, an opportunity that's on the horizon? Oh, there. Well, let me take the second part of it uh, first. Uh, opportunities, I I see. A lot of. I mean, we are still, I think, playing a winning hand in historic terms as a as a country. And I don't mean just to be a sort of pure patriot, but I really believe in this uh, place. And um, I think that um, we have strengths. Let me give you a few examples of them. Technology is a big deal to me. Being the firstest with the mostest, as Lyndon Johnson would say, with every new technological advance is important to national defense. We're the most innovative society. I've already, already spoken about the values of the Enlightenment. And, and so, so am I optimistic about the competition, which is undoubtedly the case, between us and China, the geo? political, uh, their system and our system. Their system is e economically efficient um, and has less friction in it than ours, no doubt about it. But if you think about Chinese ideology, uh, ours, the Enlightenment spoke of the rights of man, and we'd say people now, but the rights of man. It was, at least on the surface, a universalist thing about all people. All Chinese political philosophy is about being Chinese. And if you're not Chinese, you're kind of out of luck in their worldview. And you really want to live in a world in which uh, the central mindset is, is China. So I, I think we're playing with a lot of strengths. We have all the allies. They don't have any, any the Russians don't have any. And if we don't abuse our allies, we'll continue. Uh, to have, we have the strongest military in the world. There's so much that's that that that's okay. And I know we kind of look around our immediate environment, and 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 it, it seems so chaotic, and we wring our hands and so forth. But I, I'm basically, I don't think I'm just an optimist. I think I'm looking at it right, and that we have a lot of things to be optimistic about. I don't know. If that's responsive to your question. But. Well, with that, we're going to have to leave it okay. there, right. uh, Mr. Secretary. We've uh, had some wonderful lessons from you and still Thank do. You. And the book is Inside the Five Sided Box. Uh, a great deal of wisdom, a great deal of knowledge. And we just thank you for your wonderful service to our country, Thanks. which Appreciate continues. It. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it.